Hi, uh, welcome to uh, the second in the series of uh, presentations uh, that, that have largely come about as a result of uh, lengthy conversations uh, that I've been having with uh, my 80 year old grand aunt, who's a fantastic cook, and more importantly, somebody who thinks deeply about uh, cooking uh, and focuses a lot on the meta knowledge of the the different kinds of patterns that she observes uh, when she makes dishes, which is what uh, makes her a very experimental, uh, a bold experimental uh, cook, as somebody who can just take any ingredients uh, that are available and turn them into uh, some interesting dish or the other, right? And so, so I got to talking to her about sambar, right? So we spoke about rasam and uh, the other quintessential South Indian dish, uh, is, is sambar right uh, like rasam sambar is is something that you will find in all of the southern states although it's more closely associated with uh, tamil nadu and karnataka uh, but it's not uncommon in in andhra telangana and kerala as well so um so this is the art and science of sambar so sambar by itself is a relatively modern introduction to South Indian cuisine, it's a lentil, typically tur dal, and there's a reason for that. Um, sambar has so many flavors that uh, you do not want an additional flavor in the dal itself. So we use tur dal, which is the least flavored dal. Chana dal has a strong flavor, as does moong dal, and so on, right? Um, and again, uh, bear in mind, but when I say it's a South Indian dish, uh, I use the term rather loosely because every region within the southern states has its own unique cuisine. So, uh, and it, there's no such thing as just Kerala cuisine. There is there is Malabar cooking, there is cooking from the south of Kerala. Within Tamil Nadu, there's cooking from the Congo region or the Madurai or the Chettinad region um, and so on, right? So there is great variety. So, at, But at this point, I am not interested in the history or, or the anthropology and, and the culture of the traditions of these cookings. I'm purely just interested um, in being able to find patterns in how to make sambar as a dish. And then you can then mix and match and every one of these region variations will then be contained within within the within this broad algorithm, if you will, right? So um, we don't quite know where sambar came from. Um, it is a relatively modern introduction to South Indian cuisine. The urban legend is that a a Sambaji Rao, uh, a Maratha person named Sambaji Rao, tried adding tamarind to a Maharashtrian style dal um, in the Tanjore area, and the rest is, you know, WhatsApp history, if you will. Uh, we don't quite know if this is true, uh, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, we're not interested in the history part of this anyway, at least in this talk. Okay. Um, just a couple of technical terms. A sambar without dal in Tamil is called a kurumbu. Um, but actually, Speaking of kurumbu, obviously, is something that's more intensely flavored than a rasam. It's more thicker, uh, something that's more intensely flavored. But technically speaking, sambar is merely kurumbu with lentils as protein, right? Uh, uses tur dal as protein. That's basically what it is, right? In At least in Tamil Nadu um, and Kerala as well, or in Andhra, you will find the base kurumbu with the tamarind base sort of uh, and highly spiced kurumbu with any kind of protein, uh, could be seafood, could be poultry, could be mutton, beef, pork. Every one of these things is you know, kurumbifiable, if you will, right? So in that sense, sambar is basically a parup kurumbu, right? So in that sense, okay. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's a there's an interesting variant uh, in the Chetinad area where rather than use mashed dal, you would actually make steamed sort of uh, dumplings of dal and add them to kurumbu. And it's actually called parupurande kurumbu, which is basically literally lentil uh, balls kurumbu. Right? So, now, um, there are certain kinds of uh, sambar, but, uh, and I'm not talking about regional variations uh, here at all. Uh, I'm primarily going to be talking about from the point of view of how it's prepared. Okay? So there is a powder-based sambar, which is a sambar that you make with some kind of powder, sambar powder as the primary flavoring ingredient in terms of the spice mix right um this powder could be freshly baked 
or it could involve uh, dry roasting those spices right so you could make this powder freshly by dry roasting the spices or you could make it by oil roasting the spices why is there a distinction again goes back to simple food science dry roasting is primarily meant to do two things one is to remove as much of the moisture from the spice as possible because you want to store this powder for as long as possible any residual moisture uh, will result in spoilage uh, in quicker spoilage of your sambar powder right uh, the second reason for dry roasting is that heat obviously activates a lot of the volatile uh, spice molecules in the in the spice itself so it, it ends up uh, giving you a stronger taste right so that's those are the two reasons when you oil roast the spices you do a couple of other things right many of these spices spices uh, uh, actually dissolve in oil the spice molecules dissolve better in oil than in water and we already saw that in the rasam episode right so oil roasting actually gets you the most intense flavor of that spice right so bear in mind that if you're making a sambar powder from oil roasted spices it will be very very uh, intense compared to sambar powder made from purely just dry roasting spices so this is not a good versus bad thing it's an it, it's it's a taste choice that you might have to make based on whether you want that kind of intense taste or you want something that's relatively more milder because there's there's still a lot of layers uh, to the flavor profile of a sambar right so these are the choices that you typically make the second option obviously is that you don't have to freshly make the powder most people don't have the time or the inclination and don't store all those spices in their homes you just want to get a store bought sambar powder right there are thousands of brands and so on this is your pre made uh, sambar powder right now um and we'll sort of talk about what the pros and cons of that are but for now these are the two choices we have so either you can freshly make the sambar powder or you could buy prepackaged sambar powder right now the second kind of sambar involves not using a sambar powder as the spice mix but using a paste of coconut and the spices that have been roasted in some kind of oil typically ghee or uh, or sesame oil or any oil that is regionally appropriate for you right so this is the kind of sambar that at least in tamil is called the arachivitta sambar so uh, this is again a pretty common kind of sambar has a very distinct flavor profile compared to the sambar that is made just with powder because here's what happens on the one hand when you oil roast uh, these spices and then you mix them with coconut the intensity of the flavors that comes from oil roasting them is now muted by the creamy nuttiness of coconut right so you ultimately get a better more well rounded taste profile um, and again adding coconut to anything improves its overall taste um, and so it's therefore a fantastic way to make sambar right so these are the two broad ways in which you might make sambar okay now um, so let's briefly talk about sambar powder okay uh, what you see here is one representative example of a recipe for sambar powder right uh, this just happens to be uh, my mother's recipe and again she inherited from her mother who you know who inherited it from her grandmother and so on so they consider it a very traditional recipe um, and so on this is just every family probably has one like this much like every family has a secret garam masala recipe this is well it's not secret because you know uh, i will link to a google doc spreadsheet uh, uh, that will give you this recipe and you can just uh, work out how much you want to make and then it'll give you all the proportions in grams so uh, uh, you could just make your own sambar powder here right as you can see this is a dry roasted sambar powder because the intent here is to actually make large amounts of this um, in fact uh, uh, people in my family would make kilograms of these right so you gather all the spices you dry roast them at home or sun dry them uh, as they used to do in the past uh, and then you take it to a spice uh, you take it to actually a professional shop that basically just grinds kilograms of this into a spice powder right um, and it's it's a pretty intense place uh, you walk into that place your eyes will burn from all of the chilies uh, that are that are in the air right uh, so 
couple of interesting observations here. Um, you notice that we use the, the whole turmeric, not the turmeric powder, uh, which is food grade turmeric, not the cosmetic grade turmeric, which tastes terrible, by the way. Um, and also, we use the whole slab of asafoetida and not the powdered asafoetida. Powdered asafoetida is asafoetida mixed typically with wheat flour to uh, to mute its flavor because asafoetida is an insanely strong spice. Um, the slab of asafoetida here is pure asafoetida, right? You need a very tiny amount. It adds a tremendous amount of flavor. Um, and uh, that's really what works for uh, a really good quality sambar powder, right? Now, bear in mind, as I said, this just happens to be one representative recipe. If you look at the diversity of South India, uh, you will find various uh, proportions uh, of these spices, and you will you can also add other spices. You can add cinnamon, you can add clove, you can add cumin, you can add fennel, based on your taste preferences. You can make a sambar powder out of any any one of this. Bear in mind that the typical flavor profile of a sambar powder comes from chilies and coriander. That, as you can see, are the most heavily used ingredients by proportion. Everything else is additional flavors, and you can feel free to experiment there. Right, uh, but I want to spend a little bit of time talking about understanding flavor profiles of spices. Um, and it's good if you have this vocabulary because it helps you think about how you want your spice mixes to taste, right? So uh, depending on the kinds of flavor molecules these spices contain, a coriander seed, for example, has a citrusy, nutty flavor. Chilies, depending on what variety you use, um, especially if you've used the, uh, the, the round one, has a hot and smoky flavor. The, the long one ha is just hot. It does not have a smoky flavor and so on. So uh, black pepper, for, for example, has a pungent and hot. It also, it also has some amount of heat as well, right? Cumin has an earthy and a mildly citrusy flavor. Fennel has a sweet licorice-like flavor, right? So which is why it's used as a, a after-dinner sort of mouth freshener as well. Uh, fenugreek has a nutty, sweet, and yet bitter flavor. And it's a very nice kind of bitterness when, when it's in small quantities. Uh, too much fenugreek would be really bitter, so you might not want that, but fenugreek has this sort of unique nutty, sweet, and bitter taste. Mustard has a pungent, while mildly hot taste, right? Um, Asafoetida has a funky, pungent, and a oniony taste, right? And turmeric has a pungent and bitter sort of flavor profile. So when you really think about all of this, uh, what you do is that you add the right mixes of these spices so that you get the kind of flavor profile that you want, right? And as you start really training your nose um, and really just sort of learning to recognize uh, these uh, these kinds of different uh, flavors and have a vocabulary for them, uh, and I think, you know, you will be a better uh, cook in your kitchen as you can then conjure up spice mixes that, uh, that really work well for the dish that you are uh, aiming to make, right? So likewise, as I said, you look back at the uh, uh, the sambar uh, powder ingredient list, you can then determine if you want a little bit more black pepper versus uh, uh, something else, or you actually want to add jeera uh, to a sambar powder recipe that does not have jeera, right? So this, is, this gives you a sense of how this entire thing is constructed together, okay? Uh, before we get to the method of making a sambar, I also want to talk about uh, store-bought sambar powder versus homemade powder, right? So we broadly had two categories of sambar. One is the one that's made with powders and the other that's made fresh with the spices, oil roasted, mixed with coconut, ground to a paste, and then, you know, you make your sambar, right? So powder itself, uh, you could make the powder at home, uh, like, you know, uh, my mother does. But um, let's think about this, right? Store-bought powder was likely made by an expert chef working with food scientists, right? Uh, the food scientist probably understands uh, all of these flavor profiles um, and they mix them in the right proportion so that it's a balanced taste and so on. But at the same time, the, the disadvantage is that uh, spice powders that you buy uh, in the store lose flavor with time, right? Uh, the moment you break down a spice, uh, it once it loses its structural integrity, uh, 
all the volatile molecules are now escaping. Okay? And at this point, um, I'm going to give you a very simple sort of uh, way of thinking about this. If you smell something, if you smell uh, a spice or a spice powder and it has this interesting aroma, right? Remember that it's literally volatile flavor molecules from that spice hitting your nose, but they leave the spice molecule. It's a, it's a one-way thing, right? So the moment you smell something, that amount of aroma is lost in your source spice, right? So always remember this, right? So when spice powders, you keep them on your fridge, uh, you keep them in your shelf, they will lose flavor with time. Uh, they will oxidize um, and many of those molecules are volatile and they will escape, right? So the better is to always refrigerate them or even better freeze them. Uh, you can keep them for a couple of weeks in a refrigerator, but if you want to keep them for months, the chances are if you're buying uh, uh, 100 grams of something like a garam masala, uh, you're not going to use it up for months together. So it's better to keep them in, um, in the freezer. Sambar powder, if you're someone who makes sambar three, four times a week, you can just keep them in the regular refrigerator. You don't have to freeze them, right? Because you're going to use it up quickly. Okay? Uh, homemade powder with the right amounts will yield a more consistently tasty sambar. Your store-bought sambar powder two weeks after you bought it will not taste very good. Okay? But your homemade powder that you make right then and there will always taste good, right? So get yourself a coffee roaster or a tiny spice grinder attachment to your mixy blender. This is one of the best investments you will ever make. Try and make as many of the spice mixes that you need fresh uh, because whole spices do not go bad. Powdered spices go bad very quickly, right? So this is... this is. Uh... So let's now look at the basic method uh, for making any kind of sambar. So there is a base, a flavoring one, an acid, a dal, typically tur dal, a flavoring two, a garnish, and temporary, right? Now let's look at this basic template. The base is essentially some kind of fat, could be ghee, could be oil, into which you add some spices, could be mustard, could be curry leaves, uh, could be any other spices you choose to add. Some, some people will add even ginger and garlic. Um, and you add some vegetables, typically tomatoes, you could add onions, uh, other vegetables, carrots, yeah, it doesn't matter, right? So fat plus spices plus vegetables. Um, and once you and and on top of that, you are going to add your basic flavoring, which is either a sambar powder or a paste, right? Depending on what kind of sambar you're making, um, you could add additional spices. And again, I say spices here again because there are some spices uh, that you might add directly to the oil, like ginger and garlic, which do need to be cooked directly in oil to release all their flavors. Uh, and in some cases. Uh, other spices like say powdered turmeric or uh, in some cases you want to add additional uh, coriander powder and so on these are all things that you will add or perhaps uh, say a Kashmiri red chili powder to lend a rich red color and so on these are things that you don't want to add directly to the oil because they will burn so you want to add them along once you've added the vegetables uh, tomatoes onions and so on right then you're going to add some kind of uh, sugar um, either just plain sugar or jaggery. Uh, this is again important because uh, sugar is a is is very critical in balancing out other flavors, and more importantly, um, it also enhances other flavors, much like salt does, like sugar and salt. So that's flavoring one, um, and then you add your uh, tamarind extract. So you basically you 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 saute these vegetables, um, uh, spices, and vegetables. You add uh, your uh, uh, your flavoring, which is your sambar powder, etc. Let it cook in the oil just a little bit. And then you add the tamarind extract, which is basically tamarind juice in water, uh, which at this point then starts to boil, right? Um, and then you add mashed dal and any additional vegetables. Uh, the kind of vegetables you might add here are vegetables that uh, cook very quickly. Perhaps capsicum, for example, is an example of something that you do not want to add up front because it will get, you know, mashed to beyond recognition, right? So this is, you could, and there are some vegetables uh, like pumpkin that people like to pressure cook along with the dal itself, sometimes potatoes and other kind of starchy and root vegetables as well, right? Uh, and then finally, you will add a finishing spice mix uh, to enhance uh, 
some of the core flavors of the sambar. Uh, and then finally garnish with coriander leaves and temper with mustard, urad dal, fenugreek and chilies. Fenugreek is a, a very important spice for sambar. It is, it is in fact something that sort of differentiates uh, rasam from a sambar. So it's a very important spice, at least in the context of the flavor profile of a sambar, right? So essentially, <coughs> to repeat what I said, you saute uh, in the fat, the spices and the vegetables, you then lower the heat, you add your sambar powder, paste, and any other spices that you might wish to add, sugar, jaggery, and so on, because you don't want to burn some of those spices and the sambar powder. Uh, then you add the tamarind extract and you increase the heat and bring to a boil, right? When you want to boil, you always increase the heat, right? And once it's boiled, how do you know it's boiled? You will, uh, the raw smell of tamarind will go away and also you won't smell the sambar powder uh, in its form because you have now got nicely integrated with the gravy. So that's how you detect that, you know, you're, you're done enough. But in general, you know, five to seven minutes at high heat is usually enough uh, to cook tamarind water uh, for small amounts of sambar. Okay. Uh, and then once that's done, you lower heat again uh, and then add your dal, which is already pressure cooked. So you don't need high heat to cook this again. Right. All you're doing is mixing the dal and any other vegetables you add with this gravy. So it does not require high heat again. And then finally, you add your finishing spice mix and switch off heat. You add garnish and then preferably temper with ghee if you have it. Right. So that's essentially what the template is. Let's take a look at a very, very simple sambar. Uh, so the base again here is oil, mustard, cumin, curry leaves, asafoetida, and tomatoes. And then for flavoring one, you add your sambar powder, jaggery, and salt. You add your... Um, uh, tamarind water, increase the heat, bring it to a boil. Once it's boiled and that raw smell of tamarind has gone away, you add mashed dal. And then there is no flavoring too in this case because it's a simple sambar. Uh, you switch off heat, add coriander leaves and do a tempering with mustard, urad dal, fenugreek and chilies. So this is a simple sambar. Let's take a look at a slightly more sophisticated sambar, which is what I call restaurant sambar, right? Uh, restaurant sambar is uh, typically more intensely flavored and often also tends to use slightly uh, smaller proportions of chilies in the sambar powder because if you're serving it at a restaurant, there's a good chance that a good number of people will be heat sensitive and will not be able to eat very spicy uh, sambar. So it tends to be slightly lower in heat and also tends to use more jaggery uh, to enhance the taste of everything. So hotel sambar tends to taste slightly sweet as well, right? Um, and there are also regional variations. Uh, typically, sambar in Karnataka will use more jaggery than uh, 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 than sambar in uh, Tamil Nadu, for instance. These are just regional variations based on taste preferences. Okay. So if I take a restaurant sambar, uh, one key difference we're seeing here is that in addition to the oil, mustard, jeera, curry leaves, you are now adding shallots, right? The small onions are a very critical uh, uh, element of the flavor profile of a restaurant sambar. Regular onions will not cut it. You do need shallots to get that hotel sort of sambar taste, right? Uh, and then sambar powder, jaggery, salt. You then add the tamarind extract. Uh, you then add pressure cooked dal in which carrots and other things like pumpkin have also gotten cooked, right? Um, restaurant is all about speed, right? So nobody's going to sit and add the carrot and wait for the carrot to cook in the tamarind water as well. So Pressure cooking is more efficient. It can be parallelly done. So they will pressure cook all the vegetables you need uh, in along with the dal itself and then add it. And then here's where the magic of the, uh, the finishing spice mix comes in. So a restaurant typically will have a finishing sambar powder mix, uh, which will be not the same thing as the sambar powder that you use up front, but a smaller subset, essentially flavors that you want to highlight, right? So amidst all of the flavors in a sambar powder, a restaurant typically would like to highlight fenugreek, jeera, and dhania, right? Some, some of them will do pepper. It doesn't matter, right? So you pick the mix that you want, uh, and then you make a powder with this, and you add it uh, to, the, uh, to the sambar, and then switch the heat off, add coriander leaves, and do tempering, right? So the last example we'll see is a arachivitta sambar, which is, uh, uh, again, similar process. You... You add your oil, mustard, jeera, curry leaves. Again, you may or may not add shallots. Uh, 
uh, you may or even may not add um, even tomatoes um, entirely up to you right you could add any other vegetables that you need uh, here, you make a paste of grated coconut and oil roasted dhania, chilies, fenugreek, pepper, uh, and then you add it along with jaggery and salt. Then you add your tamarind extract, and then you add pressure cooked dal, and then fenugreek, jeera, dhania, the magic spice powder mix. Again, optional. Um, some cases, uh, arachavata sambar will be so strongly flavored that you don't need to add any finishing powder. You can just go straight to the tempering as well. So it's entirely up to you. It's entirely up to your taste in terms of what you like. So that's basically what this is, right? So so this is, in essence, what a sambar is, right? This is, this is basically the method. Um, you can then mix and match. Um, and it all has to do the critical things that you need to figure out. One, make sure that you time the cooking of the tamarind properly so that it's well cooked. You can always err on the side of caution uh, and cook it a little bit longer. Uh, it's not going to harm. But undercooking tamarind will 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 leave a very sort of metallic and raw taste of uh, tamarind in your mouth and um, that, that doesn't yeah, feel very good. Okay. Now, so a few things to remember. Right? Um, you must time your vegetables right depending on what kind of sambar you're making. There are some places, uh, as particularly in Kerala uh, and in South Tamil Nadu, people like making sambar with a ton of vegetables, like many, very many kinds of vegetables, uh, uh, various kinds of pumpkins, uh, carrots, and other root vegetables as well, right? So if you're using starchy or root vegetables, use them at the start because they take a longer time to cook. In some cases, you might want to pressure cook some of these starchy or root vegetables um, in the pressure cooker along with the dal, right? It's, it's one way of doing this efficiently. Other kinds of vegetables like capsicum, you might actually want to add during the second stage, during uh, the, along with the dal, when you're adding dal, you might want to add uh, some of these vegetables that, that don't take too long to cook. Um, and so capsicum, if you still want it to have a little bit of crunch, uh, you might want to add it around at that point, right? <coughs> And uh, the second thing to remember is that unlike rasam, sambar is an intensely flavored stew, right? So pay close attention to what are the spices you're using, when are they being oil fried, when are they being boiled, and when are they being dry roasted, right? So I think you saw how we make the sambar powder and there are choices that you can make in terms of whether they can be oil roasted or dry roasted. There are choices you can make in terms of either tempering them with uh, grated coconut to make a paste so that you get a more homogenous, more muted taste as well. Uh, and then likewise, uh, adding these spice powders and the spice mixes directly to the oil versus adding them to the boiling tamarind has a different effect uh, in terms of providing a more muted taste and so on. And we saw this same principle with rasam as well, right? So it's all the more important when in a samba. Uh, so some broad tips. Uh, if you want to make a, a magic sort of finishing sambar uh, spice mix, just take two parts coriander, dhania, I mean, one part cumin, one part pepper, and 0.5 part fenugreek. Always remember, uh, don't over add fenugreek. Although fenugreek is a central um, flavor enhancer for a sambar, adding too much of it will, will add a lot of bitter tastes, right? So this is... Uh, so you make this powder, keep it as your finishing sambar spice mix. And just before you're about to uh, switch off the stuff, add a little bit of this uh, and uh, it will really improve any sambar, right? Uh, the second tip is that you can think about using coriander stalks and coriander roots. And we saw this in Rasam as well, along with the tamarind water, adding these will significantly add a lot of flavor uh, to your sambar, right? Uh, and remember again that coriander is one of the central dominant flavors of sambar along with chilies, right? So chilies is heat, but then coriander is the dominant flavor. It is the biggest, uh, you know, in some sense by proportion, it's the largest ingredient in sambar powder as well, right? So therefore, when you're using the seed and you're using the stalk and you're using the root, you are actually in some sense using every part of the coriander plant and lending different layers of the coriander's uh, flavor profile to your sambar, so it will only taste better, right? So that's that's one thing. Um, but I want to also leave a couple of broader tips, right? That um, 
do not think that any individual cooking step is a deal breaker, right? Uh, it, you will often find a lot of videos that you will watch on YouTube that will say that, oh, you must do precisely this. You must add the tamarind before the dal um, and you must, you must add the, uh, uh, this specific ingredient after. Yes, in, while in, in most cases, there is some element of uh, science to that. None of these things is a deal breaker, right? Um, no individual step is a deal breaker because this is not baking, right? Baking is like building a house. Every step has serious consequences. Every, the, right down to the sequencing and the proportions and the amount, if you get it right, your bread will be a disaster or your cake will be a disaster. Cooking, on the other hand, is more like painting. So if you know how your paints work, how your brushes work, uh, you can keep adjusting and transforming your eventual output within obvious limitations, right? So that's a metaphor that I want you to keep in mind, right? And last but not the least, ignore people who tell you sambar is traditionally not made this way. Uh, that Just ignore those kinds of people, right? So, because in my opinion, tradition in food is, is BS, okay? Cooking evolves every single day in every kitchen in, the, in this part of the world, right? Um, and tradition in cooking is ultimately just documented jugad that has been taken out of its time context. So let me explain it in a slightly simpler terms. Some cooking experiment or some proportion or some technique that worked well for someone somewhere at some point of time, right? It worked for them. It resulted in a delicious sambar. So it ends up being passed on, you know, to the next generation, right? And so essentially one generation later, it becomes my mother's recipe. Two generations later, it's my grandmother's recipe. Five generations later, it's custom. Ten generations later, it's tradition. And 20 generations later, it's culture. So, you know, I, you have to start ignoring all of these um, and really start thinking of uh, your kitchen as your canvas and the tools and the ingredients that you have uh, and learn broad methods and figure out what gets you the kind of flavor that you like, right? And bear in mind, I'm, you know, at the same time, and I've said this before, that yes, your there will be strong nostalgic memories associated with a specific flavor profile um, of say a sambar powder that perhaps uh, your grandmother or your great grandmother um, has been cooking in your house and you, you have strong memories uh, associated with it. And research now tells us that a taste and nostalgia are closely interrelated. So taste enhanced by nostalgia becomes even better. So in many cases, which is why people get very closely attached to their family's recipes and their region's way of doing things and so on. But long story short, it's all ultimately just chemistry. Okay. So just go forth and invent your own sambar powder and just use this basic method. And again, feel free to change the sequence of things as well. Uh, even the method I gave here is by no means uh, the, the, the gospel uh, way of, of doing things. Let me give you a very simple example, right? Uh, for years, I've been told by lots of expert cooks in my family and literally thousands of YouTube videos that you must always cook the tamarind water before you add the, the dal, right? And I assume that, oh, I mean, there must be some reason to it. Uh, and people would say, no, no, no. And if you overcook the dal, you will lose all flavor. Uh, and ultimately, food science tells me that actually tur dal does really does not have any flavor at all. So how does cooking it longer uh, make any difference, especially given that it's been cooked in the pressure cooker uh, for a fair bit of time. Uh, and then eventually, as I saw a lot more people cook and expanded my you know perspectives a little bit, I found that there were people who were making sambar by adding the dal right up front and then adding the tamarind water towards the end. And of course, still cooking it for five to 10 minutes after the tamarind water is added, right? And so therefore do not treat anything as some kind of uh, 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 sort of gospel truth here when it comes to cooking at all. Always experiment. I think a, a, my intent is to give you some sort of a starting point. Right? Then uh, the more you keep doing this, you will figure out that some methods work for you and some methods you know, don't work for you. And you might invent some tricks uh, uh, that you know, perhaps uh, yield a better tasting sambar to your tastes. So go forth and invent your own sambar powder and use this framework uh, 
and invent something that works for you and experiment boldly. Thank you. Thank you.